Hi everyone, how are you doing? Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, what I'm doing online now on Instagram is I'm going to do the daily Bible reading show. I'm going to do it on Instagram just because, you know, something different. Um, and yeah, uh, so it means that I won't have like the verses on screen, which I typically do when I live stream onto the other channels. But it means that, you know, it's more uh, personal, I guess. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read uh, today's readings from my computer, from my laptop. Let me show it to you. Can I do that? Actually, I wonder, can I just switch over my camera? Yeah, I think, uh, so these are the verses we're looking at today. So I'm just gonna read out the verses from here and I'm just gonna make some comments. Yeah. And then hopefully uh, after that, I'm going to take the recording from this and I'm gonna put it on the usual channels. Um, but yeah, okay, so um, what are we doing today? We are reading four different passages from the Bible, and that's what we do every day uh, with the idea that if we keep doing this every day, we'll go through the Bible in a year. And this uh, Bible reading plan uh, is by this guy named Robert Murray McShane. He's this Scottish guy that lived like 100 years ago or something like that. And he came up with this plan, and many people use it today and i'm just going through it today is wednesday oh mail just arrived yeah today's wednesday february the 17th we're looking at genesis 50 the last chapter of genesis uh, luke chapter 3 job 16 and 17 and 1 corinthians chapter 4. so okay all right um yeah so just reading the bible uh read, starting from genesis chapter 50 this is the last chapter of Genesis. Uh, hi Eunice. Hey. <laughs> and so, yep, so Genesis 50, and here it goes. Then Joseph fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Very drama. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. Not something we do these days, you know, embalming, but I guess in Egyptian culture, uh, to preserve the body. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, so that it is how many days were required for embalming, and the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. So wow, forty days to embalm a body. Um, I think maybe this was a an honor that was given to him. Maybe I guess they only did this for kings, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't know how the Egyptians buried their dead, their dead in the old days. Uh, but this way, you know, he had to transport his body back to Canaan because his dad's last wish was for him to be buried in a cave, that cave in Machpelah. So they, I guess they had to embalm him. So verse 4, this is Genesis 50. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore, please, uh, let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. He's like applying for annual leave from Pharaoh to go and bury his father. Verse 6, And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So it's a serious thing, your dad's last request. You have to do this. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So big rombongan, big group of people went with him, all from Pharaoh's household, all his assistants. As well, verse 8, as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household, only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. So no kids. I guess because it was a long journey. And, you know, they already settled in Egypt. So this was really just for the funeral. This is like the, this procession. They, they weren't moving back to Canaan. Egypt was at least at this point of time their home. And this was just honoring their father's last wish. Okay, so verse 9. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, I guess, for protection. It was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, so at the border of Canaan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. So, wow, so they had this 
um, wake, I guess. And I guess now it makes sense why they embalmed the body. There was this long journey. And, you know, there was a morning before that for 70 days already. So, you know, um, I can't help but think of funerals that I've been to, you know, wakes I've been to, and just the sadness and the reflection that happens. Uh, on the one hand, you know, it's great to have lots of people come with you and to share that sadness. But also, you know, um, I guess there are times when you just want to be alone, just want to reflect on the person whom you love, whom you're saying goodbye to. And so I guess this particular time, these seven days, as that last goodbye, that's what they did there at the River Jordan, at the, at the border of Israel, Israel, sorry, Canaan. Verse 11, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the morning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous morning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was called Abel Mizraim, which means the morning of Egyptians. So all these Egyptians, big group of them with their bodyguards, I guess they saw this must have been an important Egyptian. So they assumed that they were all Egyptians mourning at the border. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in a cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham brought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Yeah, so this last resting place of Abraham, if you remember, he was buried there as well. He was the one who bought the field to bury his wife, Sarah. He himself was buried there. His sons were buried him. Uh, and then his son, Isaac, was buried there as well. And now Jacob, Israel, is buried there as well. And it's the only piece of land they own out of the entire <laughs> piece of land. And, you know, God said, I'm going to give you all of this, but actually they only own this one bit. And it's the place where their bodies lay. Meaning, here were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob waiting for their fulfillment. The reason why they wanted to be buried here, not anywhere else, and why they only bought this piece of land was because they're waiting for God to give them everything else in the whole land. So there's that expectation, there's that hope, there's that guarantee that God has given them that they're looking forward to even after their death. Verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they were worried, I guess, and they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him. Imagine this, all his brothers, they're terrified of this younger brother who could kill them. And so they bow, they, they say, we are your servants. That's what he says. They say in verse 18, behold, we are your slaves, your servants. So in order to preserve their lives, and actually, I guess, of their kids, he doesn't want Joseph to bow you know, take revenge for the evil that they did before this. So we're not sure whether Jacob actually said this. It's more likely that the sons came up with this story to try to get Joseph to say, you know, for the sake of their dad, forgive them, don't take revenge. But verse 19, Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Verse 20 of chapter 50, it's kind of like the main verse of the whole book of Genesis. You know, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You know, the idea that we can do evil, we can mean evil, we can do evil actions. And God can take all those evil thoughts, actions, and words and turn them not just into good, verse 20, but to bring about the salvation of many peoples. That's tremendous. You know, you think of a God who is able to use good people to save the day. No, God, this particular God is able to use evil people. Hi. <laughs> evil people, evil people like me, and you know, believe it or not, evil people like you, to use it for his purposes, to bring about good, and to bring about salvation. Imagine that. 
you know, to save lives through the actions of evil people. Usually it's the other way around. You know, evil people take lives. They cause people to lose their lives. But God doesn't just send in the hero, Joseph, to save them. But no, God sends, starts actually from their evil intent that throws Joseph into prison and uses that Joseph, grooms him so that he grows up into this person of character who's able to forgive his brothers and through him to save many people. So that's kind of like the theme verse. You know, if you want to think of a theme verse for the whole book of Genesis, the God who uses evil to bring about good and to save many. Verse 22, so Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. Wow. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. Now, at this point of time, Ephraim is considered Jacob's children. So Joseph, actually, his kid is Ephraim, the younger one but has been elevated above his firstborn and elevated to the rank of firstborn before before Jacob. Jacob, no Jacob. <laughs> and the children also of Machir and the son of Manasseh were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, it's almost the same um, kind of like promise that he's clinging to, that his dad clung, clung to. Bring me back. Bring me back to this land. God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Which is what they did when Moses delivered the people. If you remember, they carried Joseph's bones back to Canaan. So this was anticipating that event. Verse 26, so Joseph died being 110 years. They involved him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Um, just thinking about funerals, I'm not sure whether you've been to a funeral, and not just saying of a friend, but say someone you know, someone you love dies. And typically, you know, the family is the one that organizes the funeral, is the family who gathers around the dead person. And the fear that the, that the brothers had, that Joseph will suddenly now lash out because the father is gone. You know, this is a very real thing. I'm not sure whether you've been in a situation before. Often funerals are very, very stressful and tiring. There's just so many things to do. And you just don't have time to rest. If you're especially the person organizing it, you're constantly moving about, dealing with this and that arrangement, and you're tired. And therefore, you know, that temptation to act out. And I'm ashamed to say that this happened to me as well. You know, all these arguments that happen because all these relatives are grieving and they're burnt out, and so they lash out at one another. And it's very, very real. You know, for Joseph to forgive his brothers, not just at this point of tension and of grieving, but also after these 20 plus years of having been betrayed and, you know, left to die by his brothers, you know, it's a very real thing. And so therefore their fear of him was real, but therefore his forgiveness of them must have been real. For him to forgive them of their sin, it can only happen because he has this perspective. You know, you, you might be a very good person, very loving person, but I tell you that tiredness will sap that love from you. <laughs> unless, unless you can somehow see that even this evil, even this death, God can use to bring about good. You know, oftentimes it's comfort that you need at a time of loss. But one thing that Christianity offers is actually this thing called hope. That this death is not the end. You know, the goodness will not end with this person's life. You know, God's blessing will not end with this person's life. And only Christianity is able to promise this idea of a life that comes out of death, that comes beyond death. And it actually gives proof of that through the Lord Jesus Christ. That he was raised from the dead. It was God who sent him to die on the cross and was able to raise him and exalt him because he was willing to die on the cross. First book of the Bible, 50 chapters, and already it prefigures this salvation of God that will come out of this funeral, out of this tension, out of this breakdown in relationship, but also this hope beyond this death. We see it in Jacob who wants to be buried. Whatever happens, I have to be buried back in this land. The only, only small piece of land he believes that God will give them the whole land. Out of these brothers who follow one another, who want to kill one another, but this one brother who wasn't killed, but now saves the rest. 
and finally we see this in you know this future hope you know what hope that there is that christianity offers beyond the comfort of this life it offers us a greater life beyond death that, that's incredible i think i think um, that's something very unique uh, that jesus offers us that proof of that resurrection power that comes beyond death Okay, so that's the first reading, Genesis chapter 50. We are reading four passages today. The second passage is Luke chapter 3. Yeah, by the way, the reason I can do this is because I have Wednesdays off. So typically Wednesdays, even though it's my off day, is my busiest day. <laughs> so I was working right up to today. I thought I had a meeting now, but that got canceled. So I thought I'll do this as early as possible. Because this afternoon I have uh, briefing at this course called TEAM that happens in Cambridge. It's training of East Anglia ministry. Lots of people preparing for ministry go for this course. Lots of church apprentices. I'm helping with one of the Bible study groups. So I'm going for a briefing then. And then I have to prepare a talk on an overview of one of the Gospels. And this is for the Philip Project. So I have to do that today. So it's going to be a full day. So I thought maybe just get this. Yeah, it's when Ash Wednesday as well. So we're meant to start the mark of that 40 days leading up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, lots of Christians. I wonder what you're doing on Ash Wednesday, whether it's something that... I'm surprised, actually, that you, you know that. I mean, it's something that I only realized when I came over here to the UK. Well, because I became a Christian here in the UK, but it's a big deal here. You know, uh, in my workplace, they're actually giving out Ash Wednesday kits, you know, for you to observe. Um, to, I guess ref kits with reflections, I don't know whether there might even be ash in that kit. I, I suspect so. You know, this is the kind of traditional society that does that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, uh, lots of Christians will usually fast. This is a time um, very similar. You know, back home in Malaysia, we have our Muslim friends will fast. So Christians, you say, oh, you oh, you so fast. But we fast for slightly different reasons. Not because food is bad. Not because... Um, Water is, or even Facebook is bad. Or what, uh, well, it kind of is. <laughs> but it's because there is something better. You know, we are saying, we are fasting. The idea of fasting for Christians, at least who know Jesus, is we are fasting from good things, not bad things. We want to say to God, this is a good thing you've blessed me with, but I want to be able to focus on the ultimate thing. You know, sometimes good things can distract us more than bad things. Oh, really? They put ash on our foreheads. Um, yeah, that's right. No, they don't deserve it. Yeah, you're right. Adriel, they don't, uh, that's what I thought, so, um, and I guess it's okay, actually, um, but I think that build up to Easter, I think that's what's special. Um, here in Cambridge, they have different terms in a university, and this whole term is called Lent, so I guarantee you, something at 20,000 students uh, know that it's Lent, but they don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, it's something worth um, considering. You know, yesterday I posted this passage where Jesus, you know, he's condemned as a glutton and John the Baptist is condemned as he has a demon. Because John the Baptist, he kind of like fasts and he says he has a demon. Je Jesus, he eats and therefore he's called a glutton. And the people who condemn both of them are just finding excuses for condemnation. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it's Jesus says, and he ends by saying wisdom is proved by her actions. And it's... it's that warning whereby we tend to say a lot of things but don't do anything about it. We just want to say something in order to get out of doing something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I try to say it so that, so that not so clear. I, I'm not sure, not sure actually. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so Luke chapter chapter 3. Um, so this is, what's Luke chapter 3? Well, we'll find out. Oh, John the Baptist. Okay. So in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Etruria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene during the high priest of Ananias, Anan, Anan, sorry, Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Uh, worth mention, mentioning that all these different uh, names, you know, and titles actually tetrarch, 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 Luke does this a lot, especially in Acts. You know, all the different officials in the places where Paul goes to, he takes this care to get the accurate names and the ac accurate, even the titles. Now, as I say accurate, actually, this particular verse causes a lot of problems for scholars. But at the very least, it's worth noting that Luke takes a lot of care 
you know, in noting down places and people and their positions. Verse 2, so again, priest of Annas, Annas and Caiaphas. Verse 3, John went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This was his 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 um, ministry, this baptism. So hence, lots of people will call him John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, because he goes around baptizing people. Say, hey, you, you want to... I, let me put you in water, you know, baptism. And the idea of Baptist, the idea is that dunking, you know, John the dunker, he dunks you in water. And it's meant to be for the repentance, for forgiveness of sins. It's meant to be a picture of someone turning back to God. Again, that fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4, the one that comes to turn the hearts of people back to God. Verse 4, as it, writ as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is meant to be a picture of what John is going to be doing. He's in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley, every low part of the mountain shall be filled. Every mountain shall be made low. So the low part made high. The high part made low. And the crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level. All flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Meaning... John is preparing. Hey, John is uh, John is coming. Yeah, John the dunker. Yeah, that's really, really. I think every time when I see someone going to be baptized, I say to them, oh, you're going to get dunked. Yeah, dunked. And really, um, because uh, baptizo is the idea of, it's you use it to describe uh, something like you get a piece of cloth and you were dyeing it, dyeing that cloth. You dunk it entirely, immerse it, immersion. Um, and yeah, uh, it's for the new... Th Testament, at least, is a picture of dying to sin and actually the coming out of the water. That's, that's why the dunking is quite, quite significant because as you come out of water, you're meant to be coming out of death. It's meant to be a picture of that new life, that resurrection. And Paul makes that comparison in Romans. So here he talks about the valley being filled, the mountains being, being cut down, cut away, meaning nothing. Get it out of the way. Get out of the way. Anything that obstructs God coming to his people and it can also be a picture of, therefore, those who are humbled being exalted and those who are proud being cut down. So verse 7, uh, really interesting to compare. You know, you think, you know, John uh, as this person, what will prepare people to uh, see God? You think of opening acts in, you know, in like music. You go to music festivals, right? And you get an opening act for the main act. You know, uh, I went to watch... Uh, was it Ronnie Cheng in Malaysia? And he had all the opening acts, the local people opening for him. And he kind of warmed the people up and, you know, get, get them get so that so that they're not cold <laughs> when they see the final act. And, you know, what would be the opening act for Jesus Christ? It is, I, I promise you, if you've never read this before and you think in the perspective of someone who's just reading the gospel for the first time, this is actually quite shocking <laughs> to have this kind of person opening for Jesus. Verse 7, he said to the crowds, all of them coming, they want to be baptized. Notice, lots of people want to be part of John's team. And he calls them, you brood of vipers. He, he's actually scolding them. He said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He said, who told you <laughs> that if you didn't come here, you he actually almost wants them to be judged. And he says, verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. So not just do this act, but there needs to be a consistency in your life that shows that you have repented, bear fruits. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. This is my Kui Bang Kit. So it's expired, it's 30th of June, uh, 2020. So it's kind of like stones. But imagine God making children out of this Kui Bang Kit. You know, it's that kind of thing. You know, you think you you think God can create children of his own. You know, you, you can't, claim that you, because you're Israelite, you're descended from Abraham, therefore God owes this forgiveness to you. Verse 9, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. It's judgment. Jesus banquet as well. <laughs> yes, resurrection cookies. Yeah, that's we should call this right. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so it's, it's surprising. The way in which God prepares people for salvation is judgment. Have you ever thought about that? The way in which God wakes people up that they need to be saved is by pointing them that they have something to be saved from. <laughs> and that's John's opening act. Verse 10, the crowds ask him, what shall we do? 
which is a good question. Verse 11, he says, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food or quay banquet is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, said to him, teacher, what shall we do? Collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers, I'll, I'll mention the soldiers and then go back to the tax collectors, also said, what do you, what do you want, us, want us to do? He said, don't extort money. Be content with your wages. Don't make threats, false accusations. Now, these are people who are already in the business of, you know, in a position whereby they can oppress other people, you know, tax collectors, soldiers. And you would expect John to say, leave. Don't be a tax. No, he says, you know, almost um, do what a righteous tax collector. I don't know. Do your job the way it's meant to be done and not leave it completely. As a, now, imagine this. You're in a Christian and oftentimes you you become a Christian. You're in such a hurry to change everything in your circumstance. But no, actually, the bearing of this fruit starts with that character. And actually, it's in that situation where you might be challenged to display that character that you need to bear that fruit. So actually, the soldiers are remaining soldiers. The tax collectors are remaining tax collectors. The people who have two tunics, they're meant to share what they have. So it's, it's the idea that there is this bearing fruit where they are displaying that character in their different circumstances that they're in. Verse 15, as the people were in expectation, so all of them were questioning their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John says, no, no, no. Verse 16, answered all, them all saying, I baptize you with water, again, dunk you with water. But he who is mightier than I, whose straps, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will dunk you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this is why, you know, that filling of the Holy Spirit, it's not just fills you, but you're almost filled with the Holy Spirit. But also this idea of fire again, the combination of judgment and salvation. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, verse 18, we go past it so quickly. But it's so important to understand John's ministry and then Jesus' ministry. Verse 18, so with many other exhortations, he preached the good news to the people. And there's that word good news. John preached the gospel to the people by saying, you're going to be judged. <laughs> you need to repent. You're going to die. That is the good news. Can you imagine that? With many other such things, this is the gospel. <laughs> that God is coming to judge his people. You need to repent. You need to change. You need to bear fruit in, re re in keeping repentance. And that too is in keeping with the gospel. It kind of challenges what it means for us to evangelize, to share the gospel with our friends. When it does not mention judgment, when it does not call for that change, that complete turnaround change towards God, when it actually calls them vipers, snakes. And the idea of you vipers, verse 7, it's not just saying you are like snakes, you know, you're sneaky. But it's saying you're a son of Satan. You're not son of God. That's why he talks about you're sons of Abraham, right? But no, he's saying you are sons of the other person, <laughs> of, this, of, of, the, of Satan. And he's actually calling them that. But, but also offering that, okay, if you were to turn from that, you would turn from judgment. And such as John's opening act for Jesus. So when we come to Jesus, no, actually we haven't come to Jesus at verse 19, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him by, for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Mm. So in a way, that's an evil thing, a bad thing, but actually what it is, it clears the way for Jesus. Okay, all right, see you, bye. <laughs> thank, thank you for joining. This, this is long enough. Please, please don't look at this live. It's, it's like so long. Yeah. Thanks. Nice to see you. Verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And this is... Again, in all the Gospels where God authenticates his, the ministry of his son, the identity of his son, by saying, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. 
Now, I haven't done this yet, but it's worth mentioning that these are a combination of two Old Testament passages. Psalm 2, you are my son, you know, kiss the son lest he gets angry. And there he mentions also the king, therefore the son of God is the king, the Messiah, who will rule over his people. But also in Isaiah chapter 42, and I need to remind myself of Isaiah 42, what it says, here is my servant whom I behold, my chosen one in whom I delight. So the one in whom I'm well pleased, and the first one, this is my son. In other words, pull it together. What God is saying, this is the king who will serve. This is the mighty one who will be submit, submissive to me. And that combination of that servant king, kind of like, it's meant to challenge our assumptions as to what kind of king, what kind of conqueror, what kind of savior, what kind of God Jesus is. He is God's son with all the power and all the authenticative you know uh, power that god gives him as his son the betrothes upon him as king but also he's god is pleased with him because he has he come to be god's servant and therefore a servant of many that's why he's baptized he identifies with the other people who have to be baptized who have to be who, who need to be forgiven of their sin uh, so verse 23 Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years old of age, being the son, as was supposed of, Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathai, the son of Levi, the son of Malachi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Eli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maat, the son of Mattathias, the son of Samaian, the son of Joseph, the son of Jodah, the son of Joanna, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Mathad, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malia, the son of Menah, the son of Mathatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashon, the son of Amenadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Tira, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Reu, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Apraxa, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. And this ends Luke chapter 3. Let's move on. What's our next reading? Job chapter 16 and 17. I'm, love, I'm, I'm really starting to really love Job because um, I think it's teaching me Oh, teaching me how to identify with suffering. I don't think I've ever been in the place of Job with the kind of severe, unending anguish that he's in, that it just comes out of him. You can see this frustration with God in part and with his friends. But I think at least it helps me to understand and to be prepared to maybe offer whatever kind of comfort that a friend like that might be going through. Verse, okay, chapter 16, Job, and this is verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I've heard many such things. Miserable, miserable comforters are you all. Mm. So they've come there, again, as these friends at a funeral to be there to comfort him. But you're miserable. You're so bad at what you're doing, he's saying to them. Why have you come? What kind of comfort are you giving me? Because he says, I've heard many such things. You're saying stuff to me that's just not helpful. That's just empty noise. Verse 3, shall windy words have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? I also could speak as you do if you were in my place. I could join words together against you and shake my head at you. I could strengthen you with my word and mouth, sorry, with my mouth, and the solace of my lips would assuage your pain. Ah, uh, how interesting is that? You know, he says, essentially he's saying, you know, if I were in your position, I, would, I, I wouldn't do this. This is just, this is just not what a good friend would do. Verse 6, if I speak, my pain is not assuaged. If I forbear, how much of it leaves me? Surely now God has worn me out. He has made desolate all my company and he has shriveled me up which is a witness against me and my leanness has risen up against me it testifies to my face 
And this idea of shriveling up, of drying up, he says, it's maybe lean. I think it's because yesterday, if you remember, uh, in chapter 15, um, ba -ba -bum, yes, in verse 27, um, Eliphaz describes this guy who is fat, covers his face with fat, he's gathered fat, you know, he's, he's just proud, you know, he, he's just, he, but no, he says, I'm not that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm this shriveled up person who is just emptied of all hope. I've lost my place, shriveled up, verse 8. Verse 9, he has torn me in his wrath and hated me, has gnashed my teeth at me. My adversary sharpens his eyes against me. Men have gaped at me with their mouth. They have struck me insolently on the cheek. They've massed themselves together against me. God gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hand of the wicked. I was at ease and he broke me apart. He seized me by the neck and dashed me to pieces. He set me up as his target. His archers surround me. He slashes open my kidneys and does not spare. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with breach upon breach. He runs upon me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth upon my skin and have laid my strength in the dust. My face is red with weeping and my eyelids is deep darkness, although there is no violence in my hands, and my prayer is pure. And again, he's saying this situation, it's not an accident. God has done this. You know, all this pain, you know, it's, he has done this, he has done this, he has torn me in his wrath, he has done this to me. And as a response, you know, this is what it feels like to be targeted by God's anger. Verse 15, he sows sackcloth upon his skin you know this itch you can't think of it sackcloth you know, it's not comfortable enough but you imagine sewing it onto your arm it's just constantly there it's just this constant unbearable mourning and anguish that comes from being under god's judgment verse 18 O earth cover not my blood and let my cry find no resting place. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and he who testifies for me is on high. My friends scorn me. My eye pours out tears to God, and that he would argue the case of a man with God, as a man, son of man does with his neighbor. For when the fears have come, I shall go the way from which I shall not return. And so here, in spite of all that he said, he still hopes that somehow God will speak for him. Verse 21, he would argue the case of a man with God as a son of man does with his neighbor. He's looking for this representative who will kind of speak to God on his behalf. God himself, maybe, arguing for him and defending him before his friends. It's, it's amazing in the midst of all this pain that he says, you know, God, you've done this to me. He's still saying, God, you still can save me out of this pain. That's remarkable. Let's continue on Job 17. My spirit is both broken. My days are extinct. The graveyard is ready for me. Surely there are mockers about me. He's making fun of his friends. Mockers are about me. And my eye dwells on their provocation. <laughs> Lay down a pledge for me with you. Who is there who will put up security for me? Since you have closed their hearts to understanding. Therefore, you will not let them triumph. Meaning, you know, God has somehow lay down all these things you know even these miserable comforters is actually god who sent them to me and therefore he's he's appealing to god somehow to redeem him and to justify him before his friends verse 5 he who informs against his friends to get a share of their property the eyes of his children will fail he has made me a byword of the people and i am one before whom men spit my eye has grown dim from vexation and all my members are like a shadow. The upright are appalled at this and the innocent stirs himself up against the godless. Yet the righteous hold to his way and he who has clean hands grows stronger and stronger. But you come on again, all of you, and I shall not find a wise man among you. My days are past. My plans are broken off the desires of my heart. They make night into day. The light, they say, is near to the darkness. If I hope for shale as my house, if I make bed in darkness, if I say to the pit, you're my father, and the worm, my mother or my sister, he's talking about death, then where is my hope? 
Who will see my hope? Will it go down to the bars of shale? Will, shall we descend together into the dust? And he's sort of saying, you know, I can't just die like this. You know, it, it won't end just through death. You know, but he, he's almost appealing to God and say, God, you know, you can be like this. So he, he, he reflects on how God, he knows God is the one who is responsible ultimately for allowing this injustice to, the injustice to happen, this pain to happen to him. But at the same time, he says, but no, God, you, you can't be like this. You know, you, you have to, to stand up for me because you are God and I know you to be of this character. And so I won't, I won't die until this happens. You know, there, there's no point of me just waiting for death to happen. And so he goes back and forth. On one hand, he said he earlier on, he saw that he wants to die. But he says here, there's no point for me just hope for it. Because even at that point of time, I still need for God to justify me. So yeah, a tremendous hope. If you think of it, here is someone who is in tremendous pain, but also in tremendous hope. And it's, it's worth being able to identify that sometimes the people who cry the most are the people who hope the most. The people who are maybe even frustrated the most, maybe even angry at times in their frustration, they're the ones who are expressing that hope that, hey, you know, God, only God can do something in this. I'm crying out to God. And it does look to you as a friend, as someone nearby is going, well, you know, this is person just reacting to the situation. No, he's reacting to God. He's reacting specifically to God's nature and character. God is good, God is just, and this situation isn't. And only God can fix this. And that comes out very violently as this prayer of frustration, but it, it comes out as a prayer to God. And that's why we see in Job. Okay, one last chapter, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, I don't know how the audio is for this. Again, I do apologize if it isn't very clear. Again, I'm just using my phone. Uh, it's it's a lot easier though, I've got to say, rather than using like my mic. So usually I have to like, you know, microphone and plug everything in. And Instagram doesn't allow that. that that's the only reason why I haven't, I haven't done this for that. But um, this is a lot easier not having to have my headphones on and just reading the Bible and just, you know, yeah, speak. And actually it's, it's nice as well. Nice, nice as well interacting with people. Thanks. Thanks. So, oh, thank, oh, you're still there. <laughs> I, I didn't know any. I thought there was no one already. I thought everyone's gone. Okay. Yeah. By the way, I, I hope you're okay. Really, really nice. I, I wouldn't. Oh, no, this is public, so I went there. But nice, nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. I hope I hope you're well. Yeah, and your family as well. Yeah. Okay. Um. Last chapter, one Corinthians chapter four. <laughs> yeah. In in a way, right? Face to face. Well, face to. I can only see my face. Can't see your face. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Mm, you know, I, I was actually about to write to the gang, and you know who I mean. Uh, I wrote to Jamriel this morning, actually. Uh, uh, actually, I've been thinking of you guys, and it's been a year. Can you imagine that? It's been so long. And uh, even then, we only saw each other like once every month or so. Um, it's, it's so strange. I think, I think we'll be surprised. When we see each other again, right, we're going, you don't look like you, or you've changed, or whatever. Um, and, and I think we'll, we'll just not know how to react, but hopefully, hopefully, you know, that same friendship can, you know, some friends, you haven't seen each other for a long time, you just can just kind of like pick up where you left off. And I hope that's, that'll be the case with the bunch from Philip Project. Um, so good, actually. It was, it was so fun. It was really, really fun. I can't tell you how much Josh and I really look forward. Yeah, it was, right? <laughs> Everyone was really relaxed and... Um, you could tell every month as you went along, it just got, you know, I was looking for, I, I, I miss like having instant noodles in the morning. Yeah, with everyone. Yeah. Yeah, we should, we really need to do that. Yeah, I, I almost envy them because they, they're all together, right? Because, because, I mean, we, we can only send them messages, but they, they work together, they live close by to each other, and they go to the same, a lot of them go to the same church. So that's, that's one of the great things. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it, it's, it's actually it made it easier. It's sometimes easier to make friends with people who are already friends. I don't know whether you find that. Yeah. And then you just you just join in that friendship. You just you just you just you don't have to start from scratch. And it's one of the it's actually one of those motivations whereby if you have lots of friends to to actually want to invite more friends into your circles because a lot of times when you have a lot of friends you think, okay, that's enough. We don't want any more anyone else to join our group. Yeah, we we are, we are, because 
because we are in different churches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, even though we say that we do, we do have friends, and that's the thing. You know, Christians don't realize how many. You know, friendship and fellowship. We use it like this kind of term, fellowship. But actually, it's it's friendship, genuine. Yeah, you just you just you just you just add to it, and it's so natural. And you have the usual situations. Sorry, my dad was just wishing me good night. <laughs> I have to I have to call him later. Yeah. But yeah, it's it makes it so easy to just join a group of people who are already friends. And and I think um yeah, it's that maybe not necessarily quality of friendship, but quantity of friendship. <laughs> yeah, that makes it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're making you're making me think think of, think back to those days. Um yeah, it's so different. One of the things I have to do today is actually to to do a filler project video, but so it's so different. It 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 will be so strange, um, because they want it recorded instead, and it will be to people I've never met before. So uh, I won't do it as well as last year. <laughs> the, 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 for them, the standard would be less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. Thank thank you. Thank you. By the way, for all the com yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll 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 just quickly quickly finish this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And you know, my I feel really sad when I read this because when he says, this is how you should see us, he's speaking to people who see him as dirt. You know, this is Paul, who, who is not Paul the apostle, but Paul who planted this church, you know, from scratch. And you imagine your own pastor whom you love today. One day, everyone looking at this pastor like, uh, and not because he did anything wrong, but simply because he isn't as impressive or as, you know, as all that, as all the, these other new teachers that have come in. And it's so sad when Paul says, you know, you need to look at me the right way. You need to see me not as this great pastor, but as servants of Christ. So almost in Christ's shadow. And you should judge me according to him as stewards of the mysteries of God. All I'm doing is I, I'm almost just stewards. I like to, people who replace it with slave, I like to replace it with the word waiter. You know, you go to the restaurant and the waiter just serves you food. Paul is just that waiter. You know, I'm not even the cook. God is the one who gives me the food. I just serve it to you. I just give it to you. He says, if you see me even as that, I don't need you to see me as this great person, but just as that person who's just serving you the food that God wants you to have. And that's enough. That's enough. Verse 2, moreover, it is required of stewards or waiters that they should be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that should be judged by you or by any human court. And you think, oh, wow, Paul is being so proud, right? You know, none of you should judge me. But then he says, in fact, I don't even judge myself for I'm not aware of anything against myself. But it's not therefore I'm acquitted. It says it's not because I have this clear conscience, although he has, as much as I can tell, I have nothing to be ashamed of. But he says, it is the Lord who judges me. So again, in that shadow of Christ, you know, I don't want you to judge me, not because, you know, I have nothing wrong, but because God, God is going to judge me. And essentially, God is going to judge you as well. Verse 5, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. And I say this because sometimes, sometimes, you know, you'll feel, you know, it's just to pour out judgment. And I have to say, yeah, yeah, there is, there is. And there needs to be an immediate action. But, you know, no matter how severe, the, imagine taking out the biggest judgment on the person who deserves it the most. Friends, at the end of the day, there's going to be an even greater judgment under God. And, you know, if you're ever in that position, I don't envy you of having to take action against a great wrong or to level an injustice, that kind of thing. You know, I think what helps take away that stress, if you're ever in that position, is realizing, hey, you know, there's a bigger judge. One day, Jesus is going to uncover even more evidence that's hidden out. And he is going to give out the most fair judgment he is going to be the judge of everything, everyone's hearts. Nothing is going to be hidden from him. And therefore, you know, oh, I'm thankful that, you know, I'm not in that position. I'm not Jesus. And Paul says, don't, don't be too eager to be in that position. But then he also says, then each one will receive his commendation from God. So it's not just judgment, pum, you get judged. But also that commendation. All the hidden things 
that you've done that you think no one sees, God sees. God knows and God will reward. Verse 6, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one another. And this idea of beyond what is written, again, goes back to that stewards of the mysteries of God. You know, he's only telling them what God wants them to know. And he's not trying to use it as a platform to as some other agenda. I said, I, I'm so conscious. I have to present everything, but I don't want to go beyond. If I don't know means I don't know. Actually, I think Paul would say that. If I don't know something, I just want to go beyond that. Uh, and so, so that none of you may be puffed up in favor against one another. That means even against Paul and Apollos. He says that's why he mentions another person. It's, it's not just that among yourselves, but you know, sometimes the people whom you use as the reason, <laughs> as the reason, say, oh, I'm with that guy of football teams. My goodness. Actually, sometimes people can get so heated against football teams and it's fun. It can be in a fun way, but sometimes, you know, people fight against each other. It says, please, please don't do that with Christian leaders. <laughs> For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? That is so humbling. If you have anything, and in fact, if you have a lot of stuff, every single one of that thing, you received it. You didn't earn it. You did not make it. It was given to you. What do you have? That means everything here, this clay bunkit, you know, or maybe that particular gift, this phone to be able to, this is all given to you. So don't, don't boast in it. Be very conscious. It's given, gifted to you. And then he says, if you then received it, why do you boast? As if you did not receive it. And here, one of the antidotes is simply just thanksgiving. You know, just be quick to thank people when they give you stuff. Be quick to thank God when he blesses you with stuff so that you don't ever get to the point where you go, hey, I, have, I made this. This is mine. No, God gave me to this. And therefore, I should always act as if, you know, this is not mine. This is gifted to me. Verse 8. And I'll read the next few verses because I don't want to dwell. It's quite negative, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. Verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you become kings. And would that you did reign so that you might share the rule with you. Share the rule with you. But for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are in honor, but we are in dishonor, disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and we thirst. We are poorly dressed. We are buffeted. Actually, I don't know what the word buffeted means. I have to look it up. Buffeted meaning. Buffeted means struck repeatedly. Okay, we are struck repeatedly. Yes, I, I tend to think of the word buffet as if he's eating a lot of buffet, but no, it means he's struck repeatedly and homeless, and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When we vile, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. We are rubbish. We are scum. But he says, you are rich. You know, we are rejected. You are kings. And he says, oh, you guys are so smart. You guys are so good. We are nothing compared to you. And Paul, you would think, is saying this ironically. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, buffeted. Yeah, that'd be cool, right? Have we are buffeted. Uh, you, you imagine going for a buffet next time and saying, we are buffeted. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, Paul actually he says, if only you were that rich. He says, if only you were rich, that you reign, that we might share that reign with you. And it's the idea whereby, imagine if you as a parent, you send your son or your daughter to Cambridge University, and then they come out from Cambridge and they graduate from Cambridge, and one day they graduate, and then you turn up there for the graduation, and they don't even look at you. They don't want to acknowledge you because, you know, maybe you no longer qualify, you know, compared to their status now as these graduates. And I use this example because very sadly, you know, um, I used to go for lots of graduations and sometimes, not, all, not every time, uh, you, you see this actually, you know, 
mom and dad, dad is a taxi driver, you know, mom is just a homemaker. And you know, I, I use that, you know, and, and just this winsomely, I don't, I don't mean that. But, you know, sometimes the way that the students look at their parents, you know, different after all the education. And, you know, the parents on the one hand could be upset, but here imagine Paul speaking as a parent saying, you know, I wish that you really were as rich, as talented, as gifted, and as reign as, as you know, in this status as you think you are, because you aren't. Because he says, if you were, then we will be able to share that joy with you. But you are, you are in this kind of artificial elevation, artificial boastfulness, that you now look down on us. And the reason why you look down on us, and then he gives that list, you know, we hunger, we thirst, we're poorly dressed, we're homeless, we labor. It's not that they have such bad situations to live in, but because the way in which that they do their ministry. Now, again, this is not because they're in such bad situation, but they willingly put themselves in this situation. You know, Paul, I think, is not ashamed to be in this situation of want. He actually works. He intentionally, you will see this later on in, in 1 Corinthians, he actually willingly works so that he can provide the gospel for free. So he's not saying, oh, you're now rich. You better give us some money. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, Asian parents, we tend to do that. Oh, you're so good, right? Now it's time to, to give me back all the benefits. But no, he's saying, actually, there's a lot of dignity in what we're doing. We're doing this so that, he says, when we vow, we will bless. When we persecuted, we endure. There's a kind of a gospel pattern of doing ministry that will look very, very demeaning and very, very worthless to a world that elevates this kind of artificial wealth. And that's why he begins by saying, already, already. Verse 8 said, already you are kings. Already you have become rich. Because actually, here's the thing. He chose that life. Yeah, he did. And, you know, um, and oftentimes, I mean, of course, Jesus gave him no choice that you'll, you'll, you'll be, you, you'll, he says, I'll show you how much you have to suffer <laughs> for my sake. So on the one hand, it was given to him. Yeah, you know, he was, yeah, he was, he was brilliant. He'd be saying in his old life. And I think, you know, even after, I think even after he became a missionary, he said, he was saying later on, he says, don't we deserve, you know, to be supported and stuff. But he says he willingly works with his hands so that, so number one, one reason, he can provide it for free. But also this already in verse eight and verse nine, he's saying, one day we will be rich. You know, there, you know, heaven is such that there is nothing lacking. But that's in the future. And here, actually, I think Paul is trying to say that all the things you wish for, it will come. You know, God is no one's debtor. It's just that your over-eagerness is seeing something that isn't the real thing. You know, God one day will, will give you all that fulfillment and happiness together with Christ. But he says, already you think you have it, but you, you don't. And he's trying to get them to see that actually what they think of themselves is actually untrue. And that's kind of sad. Because here is, again, that analogy of that Cambridge student who thinks he's so smart, who's so good. And then finally, when he actually takes on that job, he actually does that role, he finds that actually he hasn't really been, he isn't really all that hot stuff. Actually, he realizes it's all just empty packaging. And then, and that suddenly humbles him. And he realizes that actually there's a lot of value in doing ministry in a way that actually exposes you to the hardships of life. Actually makes you generous towards people who are trying to curse you, you're blessing them instead. So Paul, that's why he says, look at us, look at us, Paul and Apollos. So verse 14, and this is the last chapter, last, last paragraph, he says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. So he's not trying to shame them, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And so admonish and love, <laughs> tough love. You know, say, I, I'm scolding you because I love you. That's, that's very hard to hear. I, I don't like, honestly, I don't like that. But you know, Paul does that. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I will not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not only the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Which do you wish? 
What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with a love in a spirit of gentleness? And you know, this is the helicopter parent in Asian cultures and Chinese cultures. As you have this, this helicopter, imagine this parent who's always hovering over <laughs> the, their kid, helicopter parent or tiger mom sometimes. And this is the parent who is willing to do anything and everything to bring their children up in the way of God. And he says, you know, follow my example. He's, he's living consistently. He sends Timothy, another one who is as a model to be with them. But ultimately, he's teaching them to remind them the ways of Christ, verse 16. And he teaches this in every church. What he's teaching is not just good moral values. But Paul is imitating Christ. And yes, yeah. <laughs> and you know, there's, there's a kind of um, Asian-ness to this kind of parenting method as well. You know, whereby you love someone and you don't want them to, be, to fall into this empty pride. And uh, I think it pains him to do this. And therefore, when he says, do you want me to come with the rod or with the love or spirit or gentleness, means he wants to come in love. <laughs> he doesn't, he says, I'm definitely going to come with the rod. He says, shall I, he offers them this almost opportunity to repent first. So he sends Timothy first. So he says, he says, I'm not coming yet. That's why he, he hasn't, he, he's intending, he, he hasn't come yet. He's sending this letter. He's sending Timothy and then he will come. So it's almost like still a last resort, but he does say it will, it, it is, it is real. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's Paul, that Asian parent, that tiger mom, that helicopter parent writing to this church. And he sees them as their children. You know, there's something uh, really interesting about that. You know, he says comparison to guides, countless guides, you know, uh, literally there, it says in the Greek, you have 10,000 guides, meaning one in 10,000 you'll find a pastor like Paul who loves uh, his church like he loves his own kids. And, you know, there's... Um, sometimes it's because our pastors love us like that that sometimes we don't take them seriously. We want... Oft, I mean, to be honest, sometimes it, I've been in these interviews for these pastors. You know, we have two pastors. One is like the dad kind of pastor. <laughs> uh, everything about this person looks like a dad, acts like a dad. And then you have like the CEO pastor. You know the one, the the one that has all the plans. You know, I've 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 you know built up this church. I've trained them this way, and then there are all these techniques. And the other one is just either this pastor who just like essentially just treats everyone like like their own kids. And really, in the interview, sometimes this second candidate is a bit more impressive than pastor number one. And Paul says, you know, you have ten thousand of them, and therefore you know you have a lot more of these. But when 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 this one comes who's willing to be unpopular, he's willing to use discipline, you know, um, it almost like explains why they don't really regard him the way they do. Because oftentimes that's how we see our own parents. You know, we don't give them the same, we, are, we sometimes respect our boss more than our dad. We have, you know, respect sometimes our pastor more than our dad. And that's because we have our own impressions as to what a good leader is to be like. And here, a good leader, according to Paul, is someone who loves someone who loves and as if, you know, they love their own children, someone who models that love towards their children and someone who speaks to them. You know, that's this whole letter speaks to them in this tough love <laughs> that Paul has spoken to them in this book of 1 Corinthians. So, okay. All right. So that's it. I'm going to end here. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. If you're joining me later on as a recording, um, yeah, thank you again. Thank, thanks for those who joined live. This is this is fun. Uh, um, usually it's just on my own. So this is, you've, you've made it really special for me. Thank you so much. So I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our parents. They love us and they've provided for us. And Lord, thank you so much for, you know, leaders who love us as if they were our parents. You know, as our Heavenly Father, I think that's why you give us such leaders and such people who love us in this way. To reflect that love of yours. And Lord, um, at the very least, we just want to say to you, we love you and thank you so much for the times that you turn us away from our own pride. And thank you so much that we, when we do turn to you, we see Jesus, we see this wonderful love of, uh, of, of our Savior towards us, and we see how you look at us the way you see Jesus. So thank you for all these reminders. Thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bye. <laughs> See you. Okay, thanks.
Thank you as well. Thank you. Yeah, this is wonderful passages. This is this is great. Very a lot of heartache, but also real, real love. Yeah, that's great. Okay, see you. Bye bye.